Voice of the Sea. This time on Voice of the Sea, we're at the Pacific Aquaculture and Coastal Resources Centre at UH Hilo. We meet up with lead researcher Maria Haas. So this is the Pacific Aquaculture and Resources Centre, and it used to be the wastewater treatment plant for Hilo. Oh my goodness. And then it was decommissioned for quite a few years, and eventually the county and state gave it over to the university to run as an aquaculture centre. And then these oysters, once they grow up, they would be suitable for eating, but mm -hmm. these you said you're going to send on to Washington. These will go to the Washi to Washington farmers or the fish ponds. Oh, and wow. the reason we're sending them to some Washington farmers is that they've approached us to do research for them because their hatcheries are being severely affected by ocean acidification. Because as the water becomes more acid, the little larvae can't actually form their shells. It's essentially dissolving the larvae, uh -huh. just like it dissolves coral. So, you know, sure. it's one of the bad impacts of ocean acidification. So, Maria, we're here with all the algae, which is the food for your oysters. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Well, this is our little algae culture lab. Uh -huh. So this is where we start the cultures of microalgae before we take them outside for the outside culture bag system that you'll see in a little bit. And this whole, this whole enterprise here is actually run and operated by our students, our student trainees. Algae culture is a really important skill to learn if you want to work in aquaculture or marine science. And these days, if you want to work in bioenergy, because as you know, they're making biofuels out of algae. So having a basic understanding of how to select strains of algae, how to grow the algae, and how to process is really important. And uh -huh. right now, if you're an algae culture technician, that's actually a very hot job. This is the basis of everything we do. Why is that? Well, because almost all our animals depend on algae as a food. And even fish that eat things like rotifers and copepods, well, the rotifers and copepods have to have algae as their food. And rotifers and copepods are microscopic planktonic organisms. They're microscopic planktonic organisms that we grow and then we feed to fish, larval fish and other aquaculture organisms. So it's like raising cattle. You know, you're really growing the grass to feed the cattle. And in aquaculture, you're really growing the algae to feed the oysters and the fish. And, and this is the algae that we're talking about right here. Right, we grow three different species of algae here. And for research purposes, we have other professors that grow other species of algae. But the culture techniques are very similar. And if you can develop a good hand with that, that's when you can get actually get some pretty good jobs. These are all one cell, or maybe they might be a couple cells hooked together, but they're basically microscopic, whereas the limu or the macroalgaes are large tissues made up of single cells. These are all different types of algae. So we have green, we have green brown, we have red. So th that's one of the things you learn is how to identify them and what each type is good for and what the different properties are. Almost all species have to have two or three different types of algae to eat because they have to have a mixed diet just like we do because each species provides a different type of nutrient. So that's why we have to grow a lot of different species. We can't just grow one. And in fact, this right down here where you see the test tubes, these are how we start them off. And this is all sterile. So if you're, if you're growing this, learning to grow this, what you have to do is you actually have to learn sterile techniques just like as if you were a nurse or a surgeon because everything has to be sterile because if you contaminate with bacteria or fungus, those will take over and you won't have a pure culture of algae anymore. So that's why you have to learn the skill. But that's also why you're, you're a very valuable person if you know the skill. <laughs> this is Brian Colval, who's our hatchery technician. Actually, he's serving as our acting hatchery manager right now. We spawn the oysters, we raise them up until they're ready to be put out for in mother nature and you know so we're, we're just taking it we're just taking care of them in a nursery uh -huh. you know we're just raising them up to a certain size giving them the, the food and the everything that they need and so they're stronger and ready to go out in the ocean I always was really liked uh, sustainability and aquaculture makes sense was the nature you know we can't keep taking out of the oceans we're, we're coming up with less and less each year so we need to be putting back in, otherwise there's not going to be anything left for future generations. We spawn the oysters and then once the, once the eggs hatch, we put them in these blue tanks behind you. And we raise them in there for about 30 days where they swim around and they're eating algae. And then they go through this metamorphosis that Marie was talking about where they want to grab onto another oyster, an adult oyster, or a rock or something that they can stick onto for the rest of their life and stop moving. They, okay. they swim for the first 30 days and then they, they never move again through their whole life. So when they go through this stage, when they go through this change, we put them in a tank where we put these crushed oyster bits, these little shells of these adult oysters, and then they swim down to the bottom and they stick to those. And they start growing and feeding like that. And then once they get bigger, we actually can pull them out of the sand that they're in. And then we can put them in these, these tanks 
until they're ready to go to that tank you saw out there. Oh, great. So here's some of the oysters you can see swimming around. These ones we put in here yesterday. They're right there. They look like those little grains of sand that's swimming around there on the surface, the black, the black things right here. Those are millions of little baby oysters. And these are about a month old? These ones are about a month old, yeah. They were in those blue tanks for about a month, and then they, we put them in here when they're ready. And so they swim around for a little bit until they figure out that they want to go to the bottom, which is in usually a couple days before all of them find a home. Sometimes they stick to the tank, sometimes they, you know, they, they do that, but most of them will go onto the, onto the oyster shell. The white stuff on the bottom is all oyster shell. Uh -huh. So they'll, each one will stick to a different one of those grains of sand, and eventually you'll have oysters that are all, all in there. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. Stocks just came in the mail. These just got overnighted to us from Washington. We need some oysters for our spawn in uh, two days from now. We get the animals to spawn by changing temperatures. Uh -huh. So that's how oysters react to spawning is if they go from being cold to warm, they'll want to spawn. So when they first arrive, we need to crack one of the animals open and get an internal temperature. And is that a sacrificial animal? That then? is a sacrificial animal, but it tells us a lot of things about the other animals. Dependent, so the animal we open has a lot of eggs. That means probably the other ones also have a lot of eggs. But the one you open doesn't have very much. It probably means that a lot of other ones maybe don't have very many eggs either. And then would you hold them longer before you spawn them? Yeah, we would hold them longer if they weren't, if they didn't have very much eggs. If they have a lot of eggs, that means you got to spawn them right away before they do it when we aren't watching. <laughs> Gotcha. So, okay. You grab the oyster. We can How do pick. you choose which one you're gonna pop open? You really can grab uh, any one. You know, this one we'll we'll take this one. There's a couple ways to open the oyster, but the way I prefer is I stick it in the rear of the oyster, and you get inside, and you twist it. So you got the oyster open a little bit. You can see his tissue in there. So we stick the thermometer in as far as we can go, and it will. So here, on here, this is between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius. So this animal, you see the temperature is actually going down. So the internal temperature is about 21, almost 20 degrees. So that's, yeah, about 20 degrees is what the inside of all these oysters are. So we now know, and oh, there's actually a lot of eggs stuck to the thermometer. But we can actually open up the rest of the oyster. So you stuck the temperature, the thermometer in, so you got the temperature before you opened it up and changed the temperature too much? Um, yeah, you just get the temperature of like what they are before you put them in the water. So, oh, wow. wow. So this one is really <laughs> ripe. These are all eggs uh -huh. that are inside of the female. They're actually really plump. This one has a lot of eggs. So these oysters are all very ready to spawn. Inside so right here is where all the eggs are kept. And in here, the animal's got a lot of, a lot of its body mass is eggs. So can you show me the different parts? This is the, right? actually, this is the gills right here. Oh, this is where the oyster breathes okay. and it takes in and it filters. Um, it's hard to see with all the, the gonads, <laughs> yeah, all the gonads in there, but um, the gills go around in here uh -huh. and the inside here is the heart right around in, in this area. It's just so cloudy. <laughs> but the oyster's attached. All oh, this is gonad as well in there. Wow. On the back side as well. But inside here, you can kind of see, in there's the stomach. This is where it's is the algae and stuff that it's been eating. But these oysters are definitely ready to spawn. So is that good news for that you? That is good news because we we're going to spawn. <laughs> we we're trying to spawn oysters this week, so we know that these are ready to be used. So we'll have a spawn for this week and maybe one for next week as well. So we try to do a, a spawn every week um, over here, but sometimes. It's uh, every two weeks. So. We now know how, what temperature they are, and I took the temperature of the water, and the water is 21 degrees. So that means we can 
put these oysters in the water and they won't be going through any temperature change. If they were too cold, we would leave them out here where they'd kind of warm up with the, the air temperature. Uh -huh. They would warm up and then we'd put them in the water. But if the water's cold and the oysters are warm, the oysters might spawn. So we got to you know, put them in the refrigerator if they're too warm or we got to leave them out in the air if they're too cold. So, But now that they're the same temperature, we can start we have empty tanks prepared for them and we can put them in there and uh, hold them for spawning. Actually, I'm gonna need help with this because I can't, I have eggs all over my hands <laughs> and as oysters, no, no, not, not this one, this, start putting these ones in. But, um, if you put eggs in, they re also react in that way. If they sense eggs in the water, they'll, they, start, spawning. they'll start spawning. And so they're, they're a community animal, so as one starts spawning, they all start spawning. So if I put my hands in those tanks, those other guys would 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 smell it on my hands, oh, and wow. there'd be a few eggs in the water, and they would all start spawning. For each can, there's um, there's a water pipe coming in, an algae pipe, just like the regular tanks we have over there. These ones have a drain on the side. It actually is as the tank is filling up, it gets to this pipe that's on the side, and as it gets to that height, it'll overflow from there as opposed to overflowing from the can. Uh huh. So that just serves as a drain for us. So. It's taking water from the bottom, water's coming in from the top, and it comes out through the pipe through the bottom. And so we put labels on them when they arrive and if they're what condition they're in. So. And is this still the Pacific oyster? These are all Pacific oysters, yeah, the ones we have in here. And is that about as big as they get? Yeah, that's about as well. Um, they actually can get a little bit bigger. These ones are probably about a, um, a three to four-year-old animal, some of these larger ones. Smaller ones are maybe like a two-year-old, but they kind of give, they give you, um, when we get broodstock, a lot of times we get different sizes, like a small ones mm -hmm. and the big ones, because as oysters start out, they all start out as male. And so a small oyster is typically a male, but as they get older, large animals, they go under metamorphosis where they actually turn into female. Do you find yourself using any of this? stuff you've learned in school, math and science in the work you do? Uh, yeah. yeah, reading, a lot of reading. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of social aspects, like you yeah. said. Yes, definitely. Um, fortunately, here we got a really great uh, work crew, and we work well with each other. We know what needs to be done, and we kind of complement one another in areas that we're not so strong in. So at the end of your project, if everything goes the way you envision it, what will you discover? What will you find out? Um, I'm hoping to find out, as far as this species, whether or not it'll be sustainable in the long run. And hopefully, it'll benefit Hawaii in producing more jobs or even just get other students or even people, um, private industries, to get interested in something and want to you know, do their own endeavor and kind of see, you know, ask themselves what can be done, what can I do, and then just go ahead and try and do it, you know. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. I studied uh, marine science at UH Hilo and um, emphasized aquaculture. Actually worked with Maria and uh, loved it so much, loved aquaculture that I uh, wanted to pursue a career in it. This is our bag system. Um, after the algae leaves the lab, we bring them out here and we start these bags. This is our catoceros side and this is uh, our isocrisis side. The isocrisis is better for the, uh, the smaller babies. The combination of the two uh, provides an optimum diet for, for them. We have to pasteurize the water and all the nutrients really? that go in here because it has to be completely sterile or else um, the bag will crash and we got to start over again. So over on this side over here, we run our water, we heat it up, and then we do a quick chill to uh, prevent any um, bacterial growth. And then it passes through a series of filters as well as a UV um, light to uh, kill anything else. And then we add nutrients to it. And then it's all ran into these um, lines here. 
it's all pressurized. And so using these valves, you can adjust how much water and nutrients is going to each bag. They fill up to basically an overflow point, and then they flow down into the second set of pipes over into our two holding tanks here. And they will collect in the two holding tanks, and then the beginning of each day, we will pump however much we need of each type into that main tank you guys took uh -huh. a look at before, and then we can feed them out to the oysters. So the bag is just a continuous culture that uh, stays alive via the nutrients and the water going in, and then the excess goes to the overflow and ends up in these tanks here. And this system, it, it's really remarkable looking. It's, it's actually kind of beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Is it I agree. <laughs> novel or do they do this system in other places? Uh, this is a very common system. It's uh, a little labor intensive, but it's uh, very easy to grasp. Once you got it up and going, it's kind of self-containing. You do have to maintain it, but uh, it works really well. The bags do hit a, an expiration. Uh, they expire. They just either get contaminated or they just get too old. Uh -huh. And then we'll just take a bag down, and this is an area where we just took a bag down, and then we'll start a new one. And this is a, what they look like when we first start them. They start out low, we're, we're not harvesting this one, and we build its, its density up as it uh, goes up the, uh, the tube here. And then when it gets to uh, harvest, hopefully it's this dense, nice color. The main point of all this algae growing is to feed these oysters. What you saw in the algae lab is just the initial stages when they start growing and reproducing. We increase the size and volume of water and they kind of grow to populate it and fill it up. And eventually when it's uh, good enough, we harvest it and pump it back in here and use it for food. So is that a mixed culture then or is it just one kind of algae? I believe it's a mixed cult culture of isocrisis and catosterous. You know, a balanced diet makes them more healthy and strong and um, able to survive. And as you'll notice, it's pretty, it's a lot warmer up here. Uh -huh. We put these uh, windows or doors on the, t on the greenhouse to help us uh, heat the place up, oh, which really? actually shortens their uh, development and makes them grow a lot quicker. What we have here, it's all fourth week, and if you look in, it's really kind of hard to see, but you can see uh, little specks kind of whirling around. That's the larvae. They're smaller than grains of sand, and they just swim around. And we provide water circulation and fresh water for them, so it's constantly flowing and food. And uh, every two days, we completely drain the tanks through screens and give them all new water and new food. and. Uh, whole new thing and if they're ready for it upgrade them to the next stage in their life cycle. So this is uh, week two and they have 55 micron screens and they have a particular flow rate of 37 mLs of algae for a 10 second time interval. So a thousand microns is a millimeter and these at 55 microns are so much tinier than a millimeter. It's tinier than a hair. It's really tiny. None of the larvae can pass through and only the algae cells can pass through. The larvae are too big. These are week two. And over here is our oldest batch. It's also week four, but it's at the later end of week four. And these are almost ready to ship. The older they get, the more they start to find a place that they want to settle and attach to. And at this stage, we look at them under the microscope and they have a little thing we call the eye. It's like a little black dot that you can see from the microscope. And when you see that, you know they're about ready to settle. And at that point, we drain them all and ship them out in little wet paper towels. Uh, in plastic bags, in little clumps of about uh, 10 million, and <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot in a little handful. You don't want to drop that. 10 million. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, at that stage they're ready to go, and that's kind of this process. And for most of the algae growth done here is all to feed these, in addition to other projects we have going on. And how long can they survive in the paper towel? Uh, approximately two days much longer than that and their survival rate drops dramatically. Uh, they run out of air and water and they, they need fresh salt water to survive and food and all that. So, so you're shipping them by express? Yes, absolutely. And for the most part, no problems in them getting there. I mean, every once in a while, but it works good. I grew up on a clam farm. It's always been what I've wanted to do. So hopefully I can um, end up there in the future. And is Clam farming similar to the oyster farming that you're doing here? Very similar. Uh, same, similar life stages, similar spawning process, similar rearing process. Um, yeah, 
it's all aquaculture, bivalve, you know, bivalve aquaculture. So having grown up on the clam farm, what have you learned from being here in Hula? A lot. <laughs> but, even though you grew up doing it? Uh, well, I, yes, uh, even though I grew up doing it, I was kind of young and not really paying attention too much, to be perfectly honest. But uh, since coming here, I've learned a lot, especially uh, from people that have worked here, like Brian and other hatchery managers. The rearing process, it, it can get so in-depth, and for everything you do, you can always find a better way of doing it, so it's constantly trying to improve in every aspect, and that's what we do here. We use all available real resources to make the best possible oysters. So what are some of the things that you've discovered along the way to make a better oyster? Mostly it's providing a very nice place for them to live as far as they like space, you can't put them too close together, uh, they like clean water and good algae and they like to be taken care of and screened every two days. <laughs> they, they, they require a lot of time and attention. Uh, and that's for the most part the number one thing that makes, uh, makes us successful. So it's a little bit like raising any young organism. <laughs> Absolutely. Constantly have to check on them, make sure it's good. If, if the water flow stops for 24 hours, I mean, they can start to die. And same thing with algae. So everything always has to be checked, double checked, and then checked again at times. So this isn't a job that shuts down for Christmas or holidays? No, it goes 24 7, seven days a week. This is the Hawaiian oyster. It actually doesn't have a common name, we just call it the Hawaiian oyster, but the scientific name is Dendostria samuelensis, and it's, it's related to the flat oysters that are grown in places like Europe, and they have a really wonderful taste. But again, like a lot of our shellfish, these have become very rare. It's really hard to find them in Hawaii now. Uh -huh. So what we did was we collected some a few years ago, and we got them to spawn and grow in captivity. And how old are these guys here? These are less than a year. And they're small. These will grow up to be two, two and a half inches. So not as big as the Pacific oyster. No, near, nowhere near as big, but typically this type of oyster is smaller anyway. Uh -huh. And these oysters are very interesting because when they spawn, they don't release egg and sperm. What happens is the female actually takes in sperm and is internally fertilized. And she holds the larvae inside her shell for about a week to 10 days, and then she expels them. We just leave the males and females in a tank like this, and then when the water comes out, we strain it and catch the larvae in this little filter on the side. We're hoping if we understand more about their environmental tolerances, like temperature, salinity, we, we might understand why they're disappearing and what we can do to restore the populations. There it is recorded that people ate them and they used the shells. I actually had a Hawaiian language student studying this and she went back and looked at a lot of the old newspaper articles. Uh -huh. So they call them old lepe and a couple of other names. She went and interviewed kapuna on Molokai and uh, Oahu and a lot of people said, oh yeah, well, you know, a long time ago we used to eat these but we don't find them anymore. But we, we asked people not to go and eat them all up. <laughs> we want to restore the populations, not wipe them out more. Sure. But we do have these now. now we've been able to breed these. We've given them to people to operate Hawaiian fish ponds, and they're actually growing uh -huh. them out in the fish ponds and cages. Oh, very cool. So we hope that's going to help restore the populations too. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant.